Okay, no problem. Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to West Texas a &M University's 14th seminar. Uh, since 1993, this is our 14th or 15th seminar. Uh, I do apologize, some of you may have to stand, but uh, uh, we have a somewhat limited space here. Before uh, I introduce my speakers, our speakers, and before I invite uh, Dr. Gouli to uh, introduce the speakers, I want to say a few things uh, about this seminar and some of the people who, uh, who have been helping us in this seminar. As I said before, since 1993, this is our 14th seminar. We have invited consul journals from Houston. We have covered many timely topics and we have uh, involved our business community from Amarillo. And basically today's seminar is sponsored by the D. Boone Pickens College of Business, of course, West Texas A&M University. But there are some other organizations which have been helping us in this, organ in this uh, seminar. Phi Beta Delta Honor Society for International Scholars. We have a chapter on campus. It has about 120 chapters nationwide. It's an honor society. Site Students in Free Enterprise. And some of the site people are here. Can you please raise your hand? We would like to recognize you. Students in Free Enterprise, this is one of the award-winning chapters. It's part of the, it is the College of Business. And then we have presidents, ambassadors, J.B. Horton, and Student Affairs. They have uh, sent these people, and you can recognize them. They have uh, WD color jackets. They have been extremely helpful in the last uh, five years. As I said, before I uh, introduce uh, to you Dr. John Cooley, Dean Deboon Pickens College of Business, I just want to say a few things about the role of electronic commerce, online marketing, the World Wide Web, internet-related activities. You must have noticed that in the last five years, the whole world is changing. This is, I would say, the fastest or one of the fastest activities in this country, World Wide Web, electronic commerce. According to uh, one data, it's going to be a $300 billion industry by the year 2005. Last year, it was a pretty big activity. Academic world is also part of e-commerce, online activities, World Wide Web. And as I said, $300 billion industry, and some of the companies which have been created by this industry, Yahoo, Microsoft, Amazon.com, and some of these people, if you can remember when you watch TV, the television, Microsoft, Bill Gates, Yahoo, Jerry Bezos, uh, Jerry Yang from uh, all these uh, Amazon.com. So basically, there is a lot of activities going on. Now, since this industry is new, it's only about six, seven years old, there are a lot of books written, and I just want to show you very briefly some of the new titles coming out in the market. <coughs> Blueprint in the Digital Economy, it's a recent book. The Death of Distance, of course, you don't really need a distance in World Wide Web. Another book published a few months ago, Connectivity. And one of my favorite, and that goes to San Jose, California, Accidental Empires. And I want to read the title, How the Boys of Silicon Valley Made Their Millions battle foreign competition, and still can't get a date. <laughs> and this, is, this was published in 1992, one of the best books. Yesterday, Business Week covered America Online with God Netscape. It's part of e-commerce. This is Jerry Yang from Yahoo. His net worth is $1 million. Yesterday I received Time Magazine and they rated Bill Gates as one of the top 100 geniuses in the last 100 years. And then this is our Silicon Valley, all the big guys from Silicon Valley. And we can talk about for hours, but before I waste any other time, at this time I would like to invite Dr. John Cooley to introduce our speakers. John.
there was an ad for a position for a CEO to head a company that had done very well in internet marketing and the sale of products. This company was looking for somebody to lead them into the future directions that they hoped that they were capable of uh, moving. The salary for this person was $1.5 million. I volunteered. I didn't have the background. <laughs> but they could find nobody. And at a particular meeting that I was attending, um, Northwestern University said, no problem, we will train them. In about four or five years, we will set up our classes, we'll train them so that the person can move into these directions very quickly. The person looked at this particular individual and said, but in four or five years, it won't be the same. And I remember back then, I look now, and the changes over a five or six year period are immense. One of the statistics that I hear, and I, I believe is getting shorter, the time frame of this statistic is getting shorter, is that in these areas, we're going to be redefining positions every six years to six and a half years. So in six years, what you're doing now may not look at all like what you were doing whenever you started. So the dynamics of, and the timeliness of this particular seminar is very, very appropriate. I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Mark Salency is with Corporate Systems, Vice President and Chief Information Officer there. Mm -hmm. Corporate Systems is in Amarillo, Texas, and Lyle, Illinois-based software services firm, and is the nation's largest supplier of risk management information services. Mr. Kent Thornton, is Vice President of Sales and Marketing and a member of the Board of Directors of Arnett Incorporated. Arnett is an internet technology corporation providing internet services. And as I was talking to Kent and listening to some of the things that they were doing or some of the things that they were projecting to do, it's amazing at the options that they have in front of them. And I'm sure he will talk with you about some of those things today. We're very pleased to have both of these gentlemen. Thank you for coming and being part of this seminar. <coughs> Have to bear with us a second here. We had a little technical difficulty. We were going to do PowerPoint presentations, and we were not able to get all of that working. Hopefully, all of you can see these at least to be a reference. Good afternoon. My name is Kent Thornton. Uh, I am the VP of Sales and Marketing for Arnett Incorporated. We're an internet service provider, uh, basically an internet technology corporation for those of you that are not familiar with us. And the, the topics today that we would like to talk about revolve around the way companies are changing the mode of doing business. Uh, and a lot of that goes around what is called electronic commerce or e-commerce in today's terms. Uh, there are two basic models. That, uh, <clears throat> that envelop the uh, e-commerce mode. One of those is uh, the business-to-business -business model where uh, a middleman and an end producer may work together to produce their products and to sell their products to each other through the business channel. The second portion of that uh, is what we call the business-to-consumer model. Uh, Mark is going to talk about the business-to-business -business model, uh, and I would first like to talk about the business-to-consumer model. I feel today that we are in the midst of a business revolution. And that revolution will be around the way that businesses sell their products and services to their customers. <clears throat> that thing that drives that is the internet, and the portion of the internet that will make all of this happen is called electronic commerce. Today's market, there are several companies that have gotten major headlines. Uh, <coughs> some of those referred to by Dr. Anwar. Uh, eBay is 
a, a major one that you've heard a lot about, as well as Amazon.com. They both sell retail products to the customers through the internet. Uh, the, the two companies are, are amazing from a stock perspective. Uh, eBay came out uh, with their IPO on September the 24th of this year at $18. Uh, last week, eBay was trading at $210 a share. That's a 1,036% increase. Uh, Amazon.com is a little older, a little uh, more well-established. Uh, their stock, as of two weeks ago, was trading at about $126. Uh, last week, it was trading at $200, about a 67% increase. What do these two companies have in common besides selling products and services over the Internet? Neither of them. Today, there is a, a fundamental shift in the way companies are selling their products uh, over the internet. Uh, one of the main pieces that's missing or is causing it is the immaturity of the internet. Uh, there are search engines such as Yahoo, and Snap.com, uh, Excite, that allow companies to register their domain names uh, so that when they, a company is, or a customer is looking for their products, uh, they can do a search through those engines uh, on a generic term find those products. Unfortunately, there's not a good way uh, for those companies to be at the top of the list. Um, when you register with those engines, uh, a lot of times your name may come up number 249 of 250 hits that the, the uh, site brought back. So how does a customer find your products? They probably don't. So it's very difficult. Because the uh, internet ensures as those engines become uh, more stable, become more advanced, then some of those products will be easier to find and companies will be easier uh, directed to, uh, to find those companies and those products will then sell better. But today those companies are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars in the traditional offline advertising methods to be able to get people to come to their online sites uh, through both print media, uh, television, radio. So the, the cost of getting people to your site is still tremendous. Just because you put a site out there doesn't mean people are going to find you and buy your products. So I think the maturity of the internet, uh, the development of those engines will make a huge difference in the way companies uh, are able to do business across the internet. And at some point in time, it will become a profitable industry. But today, most of the online retailers are struggling to make a profit on the internet. For the Christmas season, some of the retailers, such as The Gap, uh, Disney, Kmart, they are working with the Visa Internationals, the MasterCards, uh, in offering rebates and offering discounts and incentives to their customers that buy products on the internet as a method to try to attract new business to their websites. But until we get more mainline uh, and more people get online, it's going to be very difficult for people to, to make profits selling retail uh, on the internet strictly as their sole source of doing business. Given that today it's not a very profitable mode of doing business, why should customers or companies uh, look at doing business on the internet? Conservative estimates show that by year 2000, uh, revenues will be between 250 and 300 billion dollars for internet commerce. Uh, John Chambers, the president of Cisco Systems, which is the largest data networking system uh, in the United States, says that those are very conservative numbers. He feels like those numbers will be more like one to two trillion dollars. So there's a tremendous number of, of dollars out there. Uh, according to Chambers, he says the internet is driving economic growth, changing businesses, and reshaping the fortunes of people and countries worldwide. Uh, Andy Grove, the chairman of Intel, echoes those same sentiments. Uh, when you look at the tremendous investments that Intel, and Netscape, and Microsoft, and Sun, some of the major players uh, in the internet business are making any e commerce uh, I think it's clear that they're pushing those technologies, uh, their successes on other uh, PC-based and uh, systems-based products has been very good. Uh, I think it's clear that in the future we will see uh, a major move toward the internet and toward e-commerce, uh, and those people are banking on it. Um, some of the other reasons that, that you should look at uh, going ahead and moving forward with commerce Commerce gives the customers the ability to purchase 24 hours a day. 
it opens your storefront, which today is a, a brick and mortar facility, to come to people 24 hours a day. Uh, today, from eight to five, people can come in and purchase. But for those that work odd hour jobs, those types of things, it's difficult sometimes for them to come to your business. But the internet, by being open 24 hours a day, gives them the option to purchase and to shop anytime they desire. <clears throat> the internet also reduces the cost of customer service. By being able to put your product descriptions and literature online, you give the, uh, a customer the opportunity to come to your site and find the things that they're looking for about your products without having to hire staff, telephone support groups that can answer those questions. It reduces the cost of sales. A Kohler Company, a major distributor of kitchen and bath accessories, says their order placement cost has dropped from $25 to $2 per order through their online uh, programs. It also will improve customer convenience and loyalty. Uh, the Harvard Business Review <coughs> says a typical company will lose between 15 and 35 percent of its customers. A 5 percent reduction in defections of customers can result in a 25 to 85 percent hike in net profit. So by offering better services, offering more ease to get to your products and services, you'll have better customer retention, and in the end that will drive additional profits for your company. some of the impediments to success in doing electronic commerce. Companies today are, are faced with a dilemma. They can't afford to disrupt their conventional direct sales channels uh, while they're in the process of opening new sales channels. Uh, by having a direct sales force, a commission sales force, uh, those individuals feel very threatened when a company starts marketing and selling their products online. Their opportunities to make sales, to receive commissions, uh, are threatened and so there's a, a major problem that the companies face and how do you roll out an online site without disrupting your current revenues as you wait for this new product to grow and to become uh, a profitable piece for your company. Uh, there's a lack of technical knowledge in designing, building, and operating e-commerce sites. Uh, these are very intricate, very detailed uh, systems and we'll talk a little bit more in, uh, in a minute about how companies need to approach designing and, and working with those sites. But that's a major problem for companies. Uh, it's not a traditional method of uh, internet or of uh, IT technology. And so companies are faced with how do they bring the expertise in to make these things happen uh, and do it where it's a successful product. A lack of support from upper management. Anytime you dive into a new unknown, uh, you, it's oftentimes difficult to get upper management to buy in. Uh, it kind of ties with the next one. They're not sure of the benefits. This is a totally new technology. There's not a historical model to predict what the uh, future will be. So when you're talking with your customer or when you're talking with your, your uh, board of directors, how do you convince them to make a huge investment in something that's an unknown? It's kind of like the IBM commercial where the individual's sitting there talking to his boss and he says, management wants to know what this is going to produce. And the man sits there and he thinks a good little while and he says, a dollar invested today will return two dollars tomorrow. Well, we don't have that model today. We don't know what it's going to return. Uh, everybody's banking that it will be big. We think it will, but there's a lot of unknowns. So getting management to buy in uh, and jump forward and spend high dollars to make these things happen oftentimes is difficult. The target audience readiness. Uh, today we've got uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million people that are online. Uh, projections are by the year 2000 that number will be in excess of 200 million. When you look at our population and you look at the traditional models that people sell to, that's a, a pretty small pittance of the, the buying population. Uh, there's some uh, still apprehension for people to use credit cards online, the security issues. Uh, is it safe? So is the audience ready today to buy online? Some are, uh, some are not. So that's a big issue for companies. Um, the interoperability with legacy systems. All of the new internet technology revolves around a protocol called TCP IP. Uh, many of the legacy systems, the mainframe systems that house inventory and accounting systems for companies run on IBM and older mainframes that use a communications technology called SNA. 
SNA is not compatible <coughs> with TCP IP. So there's some big hurdles for companies to get across. And how do you put up a storefront that runs on TCP IP and still make it talk with all of your other systems uh, and bring it all together and make a working model from it? <coughs> Branding, advertising, and online merchandising also affect uh, substantially how you succeed in this field. Uh, today, uh, we already talked a little bit about that. The online advertising uh, with the limited number of customers that are actually on the internet, getting that, that message out to everyone so that they will buy on their online site, oftentimes is done in offline uh, modes, and so it's very expensive. Until the internet becomes more sophisticated, uh, that is a definite impediment to success. decide and make that move, how do you start? How do you move forward with building an e-commerce product? Uh, there's some basic steps that I think every company must take. Uh, you've got to evaluate your existing staff, financial resources, uh, and systems, and decide whether to build it yourself or outsource it to a provider. Uh, there are a number of issues that are going to affect that and, and make that decision for you. What is the budget that you have? Uh, in talking about doing all of this in-house, uh, it's a very costly proposition. Do you have the expertise in-house to design, build, and manage this type of product? Uh, ongoing, once you get the site up to manage it, uh, to keep all of those pieces in place, to make modifications and updates to it, it takes a very technical uh, staff in new technologies, not just in traditional uh, technology. Uh, what types of equipment do you have? your systems support e-commerce? Are you going to have to buy a tremendous amount of new equipment? Uh, does your company have dedicated connectivity where a site can be up 24 hours a day? If you have an online store site, the only way it's going to benefit you is if the site's available to everybody 24 hours a day. So how do you provide that? You either bring dedicated connectivity into your facility, house that site on your own uh, property, or you outsource that to an internet company where they can provide and host that for you. If you build it, what platform will it be on? Uh, today, most of the e-commerce solutions run either on the Unix platform or on uh, Microsoft's NT platform. Do you have those in-house? Is it going to require you bringing in uh, new systems that you're not currently familiar with? Again, it goes back to your IT staff. Can they build, can they support it, and manage it long term? How will these systems integrate into your financial applications, your inventory and shipping systems, uh, and your customer service applications? One of the things we talked about earlier was the cost benefits and cost reductions by having online sales. If these applications do not seamlessly fit into all of your other products that you have today, uh, you won't take advantage of the cost benefits. If somebody places that order online, and you've got to then manually go in, find out if your inventory is available, uh, place that order, send that to your shipping department so they can ship it out, uh, pass that information to customer <coughs> service so they can talk with your customers if there are issues. Uh, you defeat the entire purpose. So you've got to integrate the storefront, uh, online storefront, into your existing applications. Again, depending on what platform they're on and what systems they are, this can be a very costly, very difficult process. Uh, can your staff do it? Can they manage it? And so on. How will you clear the credit card transactions? Online buying today, uh, you're asking a customer to give you a credit card transaction. Uh, how you then process that transaction uh, and get those funds into your account is a big issue. There are several companies out there, CyberCash, uh, IC Verify, which is just a software system that you can use yourself, will clear those transactions. But again, how do you manage that? How do you integrate it in with the rest of your storefront? How do those funds flow into your existing accounting systems? All of those things are, are a major issue that you have to look at uh, as you start to build these systems. The bottom line is, uh, just like in any project that you do within your company, you have to create a business plan, a very detailed business plan, and determine how e-commerce fits into your organization. Will e-commerce replace your existing sales force, or does it augment it? 
Are you going to uh, put all of your products out on your commerce site? Or are you just going to put a few out? Uh, companies today, the smaller products sell easily on the internet. They're fairly easy to put on your site. Uh, the more difficult, uh, very detailed products uh, are difficult oftentimes to sell online. People want to talk with someone. Uh, the bigger ticket items, unless they're in front of a salesperson, they're not comfortable in making that type of purchase. So there's a lot of uh, issues around whether you can put all of your products out, whether you put a few out, uh, and, and exactly how you roll this product out. What is your target time to market with the e-commerce product? In looking at how all of the pieces fit, you've got to set a timeline. Uh, if you get a buy-in from upper management and you start down that road, you're saying it's a, a benchmark that you're going to get a, a, a particular point in six months and a year and a half comes by and you have not got that target point, you're going to have major problems uh, in getting a buy-in to continue on. So you have to set realistic time frames, set milestones, uh, and achieve those milestones in, in rolling out your products. So what are some of the keys to success in creating an online storefront? Uh, I think it is to start small and then grow your site. Uh, get something that you can put your arms around to begin with. Start down that road, get it up and running, and then you can add to it, enhance, and increase your store as you move forward. Uh, and all of that will be as a result of proper strategic planning. Uh, if you sit down, you create that business plan, you follow that plan and execute it, uh, you can have a successful product. You must have the buy-in from management, upper-level management. Uh, it will never work if you don't. This has to be a product that management feels like will revolutionize your business, that has the opportunities to, to do the things that will grow your business and make it successful in the future, so it's crucial that you get a buy-in from upper management. And I think lastly, uh, you've got to consider bringing in outside expertise. Today, there are very few companies that have the internal expertise to build an online storefront successfully, to go through all of the hurdles that are there, to make it a, a smoothly integrated product into your existing uh, sales channel, uh, and make it a beneficial part of your company, you need to look outside. Bring somebody in that has done this before, that understands how the pieces fit, uh, and they can help you make it all work uh, in the long term. So who today is successful in this endeavor? I think the majority of the companies that are finding success are those that work in a direct sales channel today. Uh, Dell Computers, Gateway Computers, both of those folks have had good success at this point. But their products and their sales force targets a direct market. Uh, they're well-known companies, they're well-advertised companies, and so their internet sites have become just an, uh, another portion of the way they do business. But is it creating a new channel, or is it diverting sales away from some of the existing channels? And I think there's some of both. But a lot today uh, is a diversion from a prior way of doing business. But from Dell, it's become very profitable because they have a telephone sales staff that sits there and takes orders online or over the phone. Uh, in the new way of doing business, they don't have to have a telephone operator to sit there and take the call. They are able to do it through their online site. Uh, it's an interactive site. You can go in buy your computer, you can custom configure your computer, all of these things from their online site. Uh, it'll process the order. It's tied directly back into all of their inventory systems. So when you place that order, you know if everything is in stock, if it's going to ship now, uh, all of those things, and it's tightly integrated into all of their other systems. For Dell, they have had a number of days, particularly over the last Christmas season, where they had in excess of $6 million a day generated from their online site. So it can be profitable, uh, it's a difficult road, there's a lot of hurdles to get across, and I think looking long term, uh, some of those hurdles will get better, but until we get uh, more people online that are comfortable in doing business online, uh, it's a difficult road. Uh, and for a company to think they're going to just put a storefront up and it's going to be hugely successful and they're going to make thousands and thousands of dollars from it, uh, I think it's a misconception. It's, it's a product, that, just like any new developing 
uh, system that's put into place. It takes time for it to grow, to mature, for all of the pieces to fit, for everybody to understand how it works. And it's a long-term endeavor. Uh, I think it will revolutionize the way we do business. Uh, will it initially? Will it today? No. Uh, but I think in the future, if we look year 2000 and past, it's going to become a major part of the way companies start to do business. Uh, and if you're going to be competitive in the marketplace in the future, it's a road that you have to go down. Uh, it's costly, it's difficult, uh, but in, I think in the long run, we'll be hugely successful and uh, companies will do very well. At this point, I'd like to let Mark talk a little bit about how he feels the business to business market uh, will work. Can you hear me back there without the microphone? It's a little easier than walking back and forth. Um, I'm the Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Corporate Systems. And I just want to relate to you something that I saw the other day that sort of defined my job. Um, not only as it relates to e-commerce, but my job as whole. And it was really a quote from the CIO of US West when he said that my primary role is to point out obvious violations of common sense. <laughs> And that's sort of what we're all struggling with here. What is common sense? What does all, all of this happen? What is this e-commerce phenomenon? Well, as Ken did a very good job of uh, explaining to you, uh, there is a strong consumer connection. But the truth of the matter is, in this consumer connection, few if any companies have learned how to make a profit using e-commerce today. Many of them had significant success reaching consumers, but the ROIs haven't been there. Amazon.com, as Kent um, suggested, has yet to turn a profit. Furthermore, many of you might have been aware that Monday, the Dow Jones experienced a drop of over 200 points. One of the factors, there were numerous, numerous factors, including profit taking, the obvious one, but one of the factors that was attributable to this drop in the market was the volatility surrounding internet based companies. You know, how does a company like Amazon.com, who has never turned a profit, support a stock price of $200 a share. It just doesn't make sense. So that's part of the issues that we're experiencing in the overall environment as it relates to internet commerce. Will it happen? I truly do believe it will grow. And we'll talk about that a little later. With the real benefit, though, where, is, where most of the activity has been going on in the internet today is in the area of business to business, the trading partners, the passing of information to help facilitate doing business between companies. And the interesting thing about that is business to business commerce is accomplished on intranets, extranets, but not the internet. It is not the World Wide Web where business-to-business -business commerce is happening today. Part of that is that the public internets are fine for non-mission critical applications and work. But when you do mission critical work by definition, what businesses are doing with each other, you require three things that are hard to achieve today within the infrastructure that exists within the internet. Security, availability, and sustainability. And what does all of that mean? From a security point of view, and Ken talked about it, you know, people are concerned about things like doing credit card transactions. Actually, there are statistics that show that you are better off, you are safer giving your credit card or using a credit card to make a purchase over the internet than you are handing your credit card to a waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Why? Because you don't know how many copies of your credit card image have been run off in the back when you turn over the card. But when you do it over the internet, there's the only the single transaction. So security, in that sense, is not so much the issue. However, in the business-to-business -business world, the real issues are revolving around areas best known as industrial espionage. What about hackers getting into the systems, getting into areas they don't belong? More importantly, what about hijackers? There's a whole industry that's revolving around people sitting outside of your firewall 
and intercepting the traffic and taking information. And it's not so much that they're looking to take financial information, but they're looking at intellectual property, the way you do business and things of this nature. That's where the security concerns exist today. Availability. How many of you in this room have been on the internet? I'm assuming most of you have. How many of you have gotten the message, server not available? <laughs> that's fine for you. But for businesses doing business with each other, that's unacceptable. Time is money. An unavailable server costs money. That's another reason why it doesn't happen on the internet, but rather on the intranets and extranets, private networks. Sustainability, the ability to accommodate large volumes of trans online transactions. I was in a, another seminar not too long ago with an individual who pointed out to me, but what about Amazon.com? They have over a million transactions a day. And my response is yes, from a million different people. They were each singular transactions. But what happens if you're trying to accommodate a million transactions from a single source? The internet isn't ready yet. You cannot maintain the sustainability of the connection. Not only have many of you received server not available, how many of you have been timed out from some address that you've been at? Again, an unacceptable mode of behavior on a commerce-to-commerce -commerce type of environment. The impacts of e-commerce on business. Increased electronic activity between trading partners, it will continue. It's becoming more and more important. Why? Because there are benefits to be derived. But some of the challenges surrounding this is uniformity of the data and the data standards. If two companies or more companies elect to communicate with each other electronically to do ordering, inventory ordering, just-in-time inventory, um, to do electronic payments, I'm going to order the product, and then I'm going to acknowledge receipt, and then I'm going to pay you. There have to be standards on what the data looks like to facilitate that transaction. Without that, it's the Wild West. Transactions get lost, things get garbled. So a lot of what the industry as a whole is struggling with is getting a uniformity of what data should look like. And there are numerous governing organizations, including ANSI and others, that are wrestling with that very problem. But there are benefits, efficiencies, cost savings. If you no longer have to send an invoice via the mail, you don't have to create the invoice on a piece of paper, put it in the mail, pay the 32 cents, or what's it going to be, 33 cents, come January 1st, have somebody receive that piece of paper, process it, enter it, cut the check, and all of that. There is a lot of efficiencies and therefore a lot of money to be saved if some of those transactions can be done electronically. Finally, impacts on the consumer. Kent touched upon some of these. Well, what's really happening here is a change in the delivery or the interaction. There are things happening that are disintermediating the middleman. How many of you think that the travel agent as we know today will be here five years from now? <coughs> that whole process will be disintermediated. Why? Because now through the internet, any one of us can go out and find the best fare on whatever airline to go to two points that we want to go to. We can get the best rate for a hotel. We can do all of those types of processes. Now, one would like to think that we, the consumer, will benefit from that because all of a sudden the airlines are going to say, well, we no longer need to pay a 10% commission. Uh, I suspect we're not going to see a 10% decrease in airline fares, though. What will happen, though, is that there will be those type of activities. The other area, as Ken touched upon, is companies are struggling. If you have a large investment in your brick and mortar, in a physical structure, if you're Walmart, how do you also get into the inter internet business without alienating all of your associates? Particularly if you've spent huge capital investments, as say here in Amarillo, in what, less than a 50-mile radius, there are three that I know of Walmart supercenters. 
you're ready to write that investment off. Now, where there is a good place, well, you was in the more rural areas where maybe it doesn't make economic sense to put a wall on. So companies are wrestling with how do I reconcile this? How do I allow for the fact that I'm not necessarily correct, collecting or creating new wealth, I'm transferring the means by which that happens? From where I sit, and it's open to debate because this is a rapidly changing environment, the only people who truly appear to be making new money, not just moving money around, but need to be making new money, are the people who provide access. Arnett is a company that didn't exist five years ago. Its very being is a result of this increased use of electronic commerce and the need for people to, to communicate in a wired world. CompuServe, AOL, these are the companies that are making money. The people who also provide the portals, Yahoo, Excite, the search engines. But if you notice about those search engines, what happens when you log on to one of them? There's an advertising banner along the top. That's where they're making the money, because that space is very, very coveted. And companies will pay a great deal of money to have that advertising space, because then they hope that will facilitate their e-commerce. That is sort of the view from where I'm at. There are two different views, obviously. There's the view of the consumer side, an area that's still very much growing, subject to a lot of maturity and a lot of evolution. And then the business to business, which has been in place for far longer, and I think will continue to grow in its overall need into the marketplace. It will serve a purpose. But there were a lot of business issues that yet still have to be worked out when you begin to think about, well, I'm disintermediating part about what I already do. Is there a true opportunity to make money there, or is it just a cost savings? And what are the costs associated with those cost savings in terms of human capital? perception, and opportunity. Thank you very much. At this time, we open this floor for your questions. Any questions to our speakers? <coughs> Any questions, comments? Yes, please, Kathy. Extranet is a term that applies to two organizations that may have their own internal nets, networks, like the WT campus is networked. And then when you communicate, say, with tech down the way, and their network, when those two networks touch, that becomes an extranet. But it's still a closed environment, and therefore it has a lot of protection and security involved with it. And that is historically how businesses conduct the transaction. In a corporate system, we have close to 10,000 different users across the country who do business with us. And what it is is really touch points between our network and their network. So our customer may have a 1,000 users that are sitting on their local area network. And it's only really a wire that runs between their network and our network that connect the two, forming an extra network. Other questions, comments? Yes. You uh, both mentioned the um, transferring of customers from actually going into the brick and mortar storefront <coughs> to doing business on the internet. Um, isn't that just another medium of competition now? The, the larger companies don't actually get onto the internet and do that internet business, but they're actually going to leave those customers going to another company where that uh, is more convenient. I think that's very much a risk, and that's why companies are, even though today it's not a profitable model from the, the retail sector, they're realizing that they have to go <coughs> after those customers. Uh, when you talk about turnover of customers to other companies, uh, those are the types of things you have to do to prevent loss. You can say, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to continue to do business the way I do today, and you do put yourself at risk to lose those customers to a who is willing to go to the new environment. And I think that will continue to grow as, as the acceptance of the internet and trading of the internet uh, grows. Other questions, comments? What do you see the difference between NT and Unix? Which one is going to, to I think Nobel is, is sinking fast than NT and Unix both, um, particularly Unix. 
That's, that's been a, a debated question for years in the uh, IT industry. Um, Unix is a very stable, very solid, uh, more secure platform than NT, but it is also a more difficult platform to work on. Uh, NT has gotten very good acceptance in the small to medium business environment. Uh, it's much easier to manage, it's much easier to work with, and I think in those environments, NT will continue to grow and flourish. I think uh, Unix will have its place in the medium to large environment, or where security is at a premium. Uh, today, it, it just is a much more solid platform. Uh, we have a lot fewer issues working with Unix than we do with NT. Uh, but I think NT will continue to grow, particularly in those smaller environments. And, but as an adjunct to that, let's not forget one other platform that's been around since the dawn of computing, and that is the mainframe, the system pre-mining the environment, which is also being increasingly used to host electronic commerce sites. Kent mentioned earlier that they work with IBM. Well, IBM is one of the, the pioneers of that whole area. And there are companies who have made the jump from start on a small platform to realize that they handle the transaction volume that they hope to support have made the, the major leap into a mainframe computer. Now, partly that's been facilitated by the fact that you don't need some of the big environments you used to need to host a mainframe, um, and that they're a little bit easier to get into, but the big barrier still is the cost of capital to acquire that platform. But you've seen that it is a very stable platform, it's very robust, it is designed from day one to be very, very high volume intensive. So that's not another plat that's a platform that you'll see larger organizations still using and moving towards. It's kind of interesting when you when you look at companies in the past, it's always been you ran in a mainframe or a mini computer or a uh, PC environment, and now it's becoming a server environment, whether that server is the mainframe, a Unix box, uh, NT server, uh, they are becoming looked at as a server, and the mainframe is becoming a super server, uh, and all of the others just are another part of a server, or another type of server. So it's kind of interesting in the evolution of the computers. Other questions? I have one question. Yes, go ahead. Could you comment on the merge of Netscape and Theta Whale? <laughs> it was interesting. We were just talking about that a little earlier. Um, and I think we have, in some ways, similar but also divergent opinions. Part of what I saw that merger uh, was, was really a white knight attempt by Netscape to salvage its existence. Uh, and uh, there was some synergy there. Now, I don't know what the long-term benefit or synergy really will be to AOL. Uh, and that's where Ken has maybe a better insight into it than I do. I think there's some pieces of the merger that fit pretty well. Uh, AOL was able to take Netscape's NetCenter uh, portal site. And basically now they're, you know, in, in looking at it, I think long-term the consensus opinion is that there will be three or so of the portal sites that will survive. And today there are, uh, are about six. And roughly by those two, AOL, Net center coming together and taking one player out of that market. Uh, and it's given a little bit of additional uh, critical mass to AOL and to their, their portal site. There's some pieces of the puzzle that don't fit very well. Uh, Netscape's uh, e commerce products and their server based products, uh, they brought Sun into the picture to help them market and work with those products. But how all that fits together and how those products survive and, and evolve over time, I think, are, are very much out. Uh, out product that they use, the Netscape uh, web browser. Uh, AOL possibly will take that and bring it in, uh, private brand that and make that their own. Uh, if they do, then basically everybody else would look at, at Microsoft's Internet Explorer as their web um, product. Uh, but at this point, uh, AOL has a long-term contract with Microsoft to use their browser. So there's some really interesting uh, pieces in how all of that uh, evolves over time and remains to be seen. Other comments? I have a question for Mark. You know, you made a very interesting comment about uh, some of the companies like Amazon.com, uh, Jerry Yang, Yahoo. Uh, is it a bubble? I mean, uh, if you have a stock in those companies and you are really enjoying your, uh, you know, all the fortunes in Bahamas or Caribbean, I mean, do we wait for a big uh, drop someday? Well, this is not the course in investment strategy, but one has to. One has to say that if you're not, if there is no real foundation to 
you know, the fundamentals aren't there to support the PEs, the price earning ratios of these, um, these stocks. And these stocks' price is being pushed up based upon expectation. And if expectation isn't met, the capital markets are very, very efficient. And what will happen is the capital will move to where there can be a true return. And that, you know, how long that's going to take, I don't know. If it were a more commodity type of stock that we were dealing with, it wouldn't go on as long as it has gone on. Because those markets are very, very efficient in the movement of capital. So uh, I don't know how much longer the, the investing public, if you will, is willing to ride without seeing a return. Particularly when there are other alternatives where return is real. Okay. One question to uh, uh, Kent. Uh, can you tell us more about the difference between uh, when we get internet connection from you or from AOL and if we can get it from uh, cable? Because some people say cable is faster than uh, the regular internet providers. There are a number of ways uh, that you can get your connection. I think in looking from a consumer standpoint, the cable modem is an attractive option. It is fast. Uh, it's more expensive than a dial-up connection, uh, and there are a couple of issues around cable modem that longer term remain to be seen what, what the impact will be. Cable modem is a shared resource. In other words, if you have bandwidth that's 1.5 megabits of capacity, which is about the equivalent of the T1 today uh, on a cable modem, that is shared amongst however many people in that sector have access to the cable modem. So as more and more people get access through it, your piece of that bandwidth shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If a number of people are doing heavy uh, downloads on that, uh, it's a total shared resource. So if they're using 1.2 megabits of that capacity, everybody else gets the 0.3 that's left over. So uh, there are some security issues around it being a shared resource that are not there in a dedicated connection or in a phone connection. Um, so there, there are some pluses and some minuses. From a, a business standpoint, uh, that are mission critical things. Uh, I don't think that that's a very valid uh, method long term. I think you need the security that you have through a dedicated connection. Uh, you need the symmetrical bandwidth that you get through a shared, through a uh, dedicated connection rather than a shared connection. So there, there are positives for some uh, usages, and I think there are negatives for some usages. So remember all that in future. <laughs> <laughs> Before we conclude, uh, on behalf of uh, we uh, will pick College of Business. We would like to uh, give these two speakers a small token of our appreciation. This is paid by Dr. John Cooley. He had to leave. He had another meeting. This is for Mark Solisey. It's a small uh, paperweight. It has uh, our university, uh, Old Main, picture behind. And uh, we thank you for your uh, help and uh, time. We have the same thing for uh, Ken Thornton, but I would like Keith Brown, our executive director, alumni relations, to present this. Uh, I want you to know that Ken was our student, so I think it's appropriate if Keith uh, presents it because we need Ken in future here. <laughs> Before we conclude, I want to thank my crew, Faisal, Ali, D. Arno, the cameraman, uh, Hasnat, uh, Saif people, Phi Beta Delta Honor Society, presidents, ambassadors. This kind of seminar is a collection of uh, all the activities and a lot of help, and we do appreciate. And uh, one thing I have said again and again in my classes, and if you took my classes, I think uh, you may remember this. And I strongly argue that because of the internet, because of the World Wide Web, I believe knowledge is no longer controlled by few people, few companies, few institutions. Knowledge is available on the internet, on the World Wide Web, and because of this, I've increased my productivity by 1 million percent, and I think you must have done the same. And down the road, we are looking at a very big, huge, it's like a big space, uh, Star Trek, you can go anywhere in the world, in the space, and internet, I think I also make a same analogy. Internet will be the name of the game in future, and WT is also capitalized on one point. Thank you for your help and participation, and thank you for your speakers, and uh, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.